This week, let's start off with a math lesson before Occupy Venice shows us how to fight the power while helping the powerless. The rules teaches us that they can be changed. Let's Google our government in France with a mic drop. But first, this lunatic bitch has something to say. Call me an anarchist, socialist, commie, leftist, because you don't know the difference, but all those words sound scary. And when you call me an American, what you're really saying is that I'm anti-war, not brainwashed or whitewashed. This is what I stand for, outside of party lines, repeat offender of thought crimes, humanity over oligarchy, fist up if you follow me. Not like sheeple, but people. Think for yourselves, rise up and rebel. Take to the streets, meet me at the corner of freedom and justice. In this fight, it's just us. Ain't no savior or prayer can lift us up. Drag your gods from their man-made thrones, throw them out of the clouds, onto the ground, and watch how they quake in the wake of reality. Like a flickering TV, weaker as you, the creator grows stronger than seen. Unplug and stand up, switch homicide for deicide, drop your idols, grab hold of humanity and rise. Let apathy fall by the wayside. You don't need it, that drug. Don't let it define you. Not one more line of God's will shrugs and brain spills. Rebel because you know it's the only way that this will get better. Fuck keep calm. We're yelling, propelling forward, putting people over profit. Planet in peace over the putrid holes we fill with cheap plastic and bombastic nationalistic shows of a hollow pride. Yes, we need outcries and at least trials for war crimes. Instead of libraries named for trigger-happy fools, illiterate tools who couldn't spell their way out of elementary school, where children left behind seek Heil to Monopoly Man on High, learn how to stay in line, count time based on eight-hour workdays, 365. And yet, as we toil, our minds shrink and spoil, well below average, like Forrest Gump, just a hunch, but maybe those trillions we spend on bombing and drilling could go into filling our kids with knowledge. But that's American exceptionalism. Number one at war, we're good at killing people. Number fuck science and math at everything else. Excelling at failing, failing, freedom derailing. Think closing your eyes will keep us from crashing? As we roll, just rehashing all the mistakes that dug us this grave. Am I fucking insane to think that blood mixed with oil will stain our future, our name? Fuck our hearts and our brains. That the poison born of Agent Orange shouldn't be sprayed on our food? Fuck you. We stack alms at the steeple while people just outside starve in the corners they carved from a precious foundation founded on hope and change. Crumbling, stumbling. These facades can't save us for long. Ain't it strange that patriots named for wars waged these freedom crusades that make us less safe, less free, and less brave, and we, those for peace and a life without chains, are un-American? Me, socialist scum, feminist cunt, isn't it time we flipped some fucking paradigms? Ready? Let's try. From tweets to marching in the streets, this is Act Out. Welcome to ACT OUT. I'm Eleanor Goldfield, and this is your tipping point. Let's do some math. Wait, don't go. This isn't the kind of math that you'll never use, like the cosine of the x variable squared times y over two trains headed towards each other. No, this is useful math that could actually be used to solve real-life problems. And since we now rank at the bottom of the industrialized world in math and science, I'd say we could all use a little practice. So there are approximately 3.5 million homeless people in the US. Given that number, how many homes would each homeless person get if there are 18.6 million vacant homes, due in no small part to a wave of foreclosures following the 2008 collapse? Take a moment. About 5.3 homes. So, five homes in a doghouse or a birdbath. That's fucking insane. And what this illustrates besides widespread systemic dumb shittedness is a tangible fall from grace. Obviously, the vast majority of these homes were once occupied. People with jobs, families, futures, savings bought these homes or built these homes. In other words, there was a time when the economy wasn't stacked in favor of the 1.1%, when the rest of us weren't scrambling to share starvation wages, GMO table scraps, and oil-soaked mercury-laden fish sticks, also GMO. There was a time when New York didn't have more than 60,000 homeless people, including 25,000 homeless kids. 
or a time when LA didn't have 44,000 homeless people, like uh, even two years ago. The number of homeless in LA County has risen 12% in just two years. And the number of people living in tents, makeshift encampments, and vehicles has risen by 85%. That's an eight with a five after it. And while lawmakers have made some gains in the past few months, including raising the LA minimum wage to $15 an hour, thank you for utilizing common sense, LA, there is still a lot of work to do. And although the stereotype for beach bums and laissez fair Angelinos still hangs over the city much like the smog, it is in fact in the most stereotypically relaxed area of LA, where activists are not only fighting an unjust system, but feeding the hungry as they go. Occupy Venice is on this week's Frontline segment. As one of their shirts proudly states, you can't have a revolution on an empty stomach. And Occupy Venice wants to make sure everyone gets their fill of food so we can fill the streets in protest. And not just any food either, organic, locally sourced food. Yep, every Sunday, Occupy Venice hosts the People's Potluck, where hundreds of homeless residents get a hot cooked organic meal, locally sourced from farmers markets and community gardens. One of which is their very own urban farming plot, where you can also go on Wednesday evenings to learn about urban farming and take home fresh veggies. At the potlucks, a few longtime homeless volunteers also help in prepping, cooking, transporting, and serving the food at encampments on Third and Rose and along the boardwalk. Outside of food, Occupy Venice also works with local organizations to provide the homeless with donated clothing, sleeping bags, tents, and other essentials. Wait, wait, there's more. They also provide the homeless with free, safe storage for their possessions, due to the fact that the city routinely sweeps encampment areas and confiscates personal belongings in the name of cleaning up the area. Which brings me to the next level of awesome activism displayed by Occupy Venice. Legal observation and documentation in order to protect the homeless from harassment and theft of their possessions. Above and beyond this even, they are pushing for passage of the Homeless Bill of Rights, legislation that would ensure that the homeless are allowed to sleep, eat, seek shelter, and find safety in public areas or in vehicles and receive the same legal protections as all California residents. Novel idea, right? Furthermore, yeah, not even done yet. Um, Occupy Venice co-hosts and organizes civil rights workshops, which include swag like arrest rights shirts and flyers. And they're currently working with other grassroots organizations to overturn the Venice boardwalk curfew, demand affordable housing for lower income and displaced residents, and work directly with city officials to deal with the issue of homelessness. Outside of town hall discussions and workshops on anti-eviction and homeowner slash renter rights, they also host the Docupy Film and Speaker Series to show and discuss films that educate and empower the people. Fucking A, right? To help support their work, you can donate food or resources by contacting this number. I will, of course, include their other contact information at the end of the episode, where you'll also find some fantastic shirts, like this one, which they'll send to you for a donation. To all my friends at Occupy Venice, if I had a fucking awesome award of the week, you'd so get it. Keep acting out and FTP. Feed the people. Now, the work that Occupy Venice and their partners are doing is multifaceted. First off, that was a berry. First off, they represent a movement, a coming together of people in the name of justice, voiced via a local issue. In this case, homelessness as an effect of income inequality and systemic injustice. With this pointed goal, they work to mitigate the effects of homelessness while also working to unfuck the system that creates homelessness. And that's key. Feeding the homeless is nothing short of honorable, but if you don't also hold the system who created them accountable, you're squirting a back teen on a tumor that will only continue to grow. There is no discrete issue. No issue that stands alone, that isn't tied to the homicidal drones on their thrones napalming our rights. We have to draw these lines. The ties that bind follow them to conclusion, the collusion of government and the 1%. This is where our fight, or at least part of our fight, has to take us. Homelessness isn't normal. Poverty is not normal. It's planned. Like a fucking garden party or an OCD person's wardrobe, that shit is laid out with specific rules on who plays and who gets played. Now, as Bill Moyer said in last week's episode, the war against the imagination is the only war that matters because all other wars are subsumed by it. We believe poverty is normal because it's always been there. That the best we can do is throw some money at a homeless person or put a yellow ribbon on our car to support the troops. We believe that we can't radically change the way the world looks because we've been told that we can't. Now imagine that you could. Imagine that these rules you're being played by can not only be changed, but should be changed. 
An organization called The Rules seeks to instill in you and indeed the world with this power of imagination. I'll let founder Martin Kirk elaborate further. So The Rules is really just a collective of people around the world, um, various people from artists to writers to, to coders to, to people who are interested in looking at the root causes of global inequality and poverty. So one of the things we, I mean, one of the reasons we call ourselves The Rules is to try and differentiate ourselves from that whole um, concept of global poverty and inequality uh, that is um, very dominant now, which is around uh, development and aid, foreign aid and charities and all that sort of thing, which um, which we think is m much more of a problem than any sort of solution to it. So we set ourselves up in 2012, end of 2012, we've been going since then, and our whole kind of MO really is to try and shift that discourse. It's about the rules of the game. It's about how the system is rigged. It's a very kind of occupy message um, uh, in that sense. And so, so as you say, we do, we do our work in two ways. One is we work, hook up with um, social movements around the world. We make content on our own. So we produ we've produced a few videos now. We produced one that came out just at the beginning of this year called Capitalism is Just a Story, which tries yeah. to so that, that just tries to get to the idea that this isn't an insol insoluble problem. This is, some, this, this, is, this is something we can do something about. Ultimately, it's about belief systems and what we believe. And how are you able to, I mean, you said that it, it may sound a little grand, but how do you focus on, on such a global scale, particularly when you're working with, uh, with communities that are very grassroots and movements that are very grassroots? How do you connect this onto that global scale? Yeah, no, that's a constant challenge. I mean, one thing that we do try to do is bring sci some, some particular scientific methodology to bear, particularly around cognitive linguistics and systems thinking. So there is such a thing as a global conversation um, uh, that sets the global norm, that is within which all political decisions are made, um, uh, all popular opinion is formed, um, and actually occupies a great example of, of, of an, an effort that hacked that global conversation. You know, it occupied got the 199% meme into the global conversation in, in, in an incredibly powerful way, and it's changed the conversation profoundly, fundamentally. And so we do things like we, we scan LexisNexis database of every, all media that's been written about, and then we analyze it. We break it down, we code it, we use data analysts, um, we use cognitive linguists then to kind of analyze the framing of it. So we try to get as clear and solid a, an understanding of that discourse as possible in order to then be able to intervene in, a, in an effective way. Um, and right now there is we actually wrote a pamphlet called The One Party Planet at the end of last year that really picked us apart a bit, where we just said there is essentially one political party in control and it's kind of held together by an ideology, a near, very extreme neoliberal ideology. Um, and it's the same in Kenya as it is in Guatemala, as it is in Wall Street, as it is in, in the UK. You know, it, we have to get into understanding that this is a global operating system that's programmed with neoliberal programming and, and one of the ways it's held together is through communications and discourse and dialogue. So, so that's our particular contribution way to get into it. So would it, be, would it be correct in saying that the, the rules, your sort of transformational agenda for change is to really combat the, the mind and sort of shift paradigms as opposed to, you know, um, as opposed to pushing people to act a certain way? You're really trying to shift their minds so that they then act a certain way. Exactly. That's exactly as well put. <laughs> um, you know, the, what we believe and the, the largely kind of subconscious associations and assumptions we make and that rich, rich soil of belief is where all action grows from. So if you can get into that rich soil of belief and you can start to work at that level, because we know for damn sure that's the level that most of the, the neoliberals work at uh, and have done for a long time. So we're a long way behind the game here. This isn't, we're not trying to do anything that is not being done to us day in, day out. And I'll give you an example of an, of an idea that we think is really, really important. So one very small idea um, is that poverty is created. Poverty isn't a natural occurrence. It's not just this, this terrible thing that we're all getting behind to fight together. No, poverty is, a, is an outcome, a logical outcome of the system that we have. And I, what I mean is poverty, kind of the... the System, systemic poverty, the structural poverty that is seeing currently about 4.3 billion people living on less than $5 a day. 
those are not people that are left out of the system in some way. Those people are very much part of the system and their circumstance is as much a product of the system as the, the Walmart heirs, for example. And so if you can, once you can get people and you can start to get this idea that poverty is created into the discourse, suddenly you have an incentive built into the logic that gets people asking why. And so it's a logic that searches out causes and doesn't rely or rest on palliative responses like charity or aid. It says we must find, if we want to solve this, we've got to find out what created it. So that, you know, just, just the concept of poverty is created. Talk a little bit about uh, this, these NGOs and charities, because it's an interesting problem. A lot of people feel that, oh, I can just wait till the end of the year, then I give, you know, a hundred bucks to the World Wildlife Fund or, you know, a, some child's fund, and then I've done my bit. Talk a little bit about how that sort of paradigm is actually contributing to poverty and inequality. Yeah, and this is a really hard one. My background is in aid agencies. I work for Oxfam, I work for Save the Children, I was a lobbyist for Save the Children. I went around the world to the, you know, to the UNs and, and governments of the world and did lobbying for them. Um, I come from that world. I know that it is filled with good people. It is uh, filled with good people trying to do good. Um, but, and this is one of the reasons I left and set out the rules, was charity is a concept. It's a very small thing. Charity is what, and you can tell this by how it, you know, just, just the, the look of charity around the world. Charity is secondhand clothes. It's your spare change. It's, as you say, it's $100 at the end of the year when I've done everything else I need. It's, it's, it's a, as I say, it's a palliative response to a problem. Now, it is in its box, nothing wrong with it. But the minute you confuse that with anything like a solution to the problem, is the minute where you've got to cry foul. And unfortunately, in my experience, and just looking around the world, that distinction between charity as a palliative response um, that can come from a good place, but is merely a sticking plaster, and the there's, there's, there's concept of fixing the system is a confusion that a uh, lot of the big NGOs refuse to, to, to acknowledge. If you say to that person, the $100 a year for WWF, there's your job done, that's all you need to think about, there's your, you know, tick the box, you've, you've, you've done your thing, then you're depoliticizing the issue. You're telling them they don't have to worry about it when they go to the ballot box. They don't have to worry about it in the, you know, when, when they assess uh, the actions of their government. Um, all they have to do is give $100 a month. So it's, it's about keeping charity in its proper place um, and, uh, and not allowing it to even come close to the conversations we need to have about fixing the kind of the, the deep rot in the system. And of course, if you did fix this deep or, or attempt to fix the deep rot in the system, you wouldn't have the need for so many charity organizations because the governments would be doing their bit to ensure that inequality wasn't so skewed that people were starving. And talk a little bit about how you see art promoting this paradigm shift. And in particular, I mean, how the rules uses art and how you see art in general pushing for sociopolitical change. Oh, uh, art is essential. It's essential. It has been through the ages. Art is art is how I is the front edge of social ideas. It's how it's how we communicate to each other when literal language won't work. Um, and I think, and it's how we communicate in a way that that blends the the emotion, the huge emotional content of these issues with the rational mind in a way that it that, that, that works. You know, that, that can be understood. So I, you know, you can't. Revolutions don't happen without artists. Um, we also worked with, we did something called an artivism lab in Nairobi um, about a year ago, which was fantastic. We got you know, 30 artists from mainly from um, uh, the slums, but also from the rest of Nairobi and around to come together. And we, we put them together with uh, some uh, producers uh, and we got them, the guys called Beat Making Lab, and we got them just kind of really skilling them up to be able to make music and to be able to kind of work with um, uh, music software to kind of write their own tracks. Uh, we put out a video that they made on that, which was amazing. Um, uh, we, when we did a campaign at the World Bank last year, we got lots of graffiti artists, um, uh, again in Nairobi, to, to kind of to, to, to do what they wanted to do with it. And it's, it's, it's such a free and engaging form of expression. Um, that captures kind of the soul of the struggle rather than just 
you know, people, people like me, I'm, I'm very cerebral. I just, you know, I'm very rational cerebral. I, I can't communicate the way an artist can. So that's what we try to do. Talking to people about getting, uh, getting into activism, they feel like it's so obtuse. Where do I start? Everything's so abstract. There's so much evil going on in the world. What would you say to someone who wants to get started and wants to help out? There are groups you can join that are either skills-based. So we've got like a journalist group, we've got a bloggers group, we've got a social enthusiasts, social media enthusiasts, we call it group. Um, so you can join one of the groups and it's only just getting going in this community. You know, we're, we're at the beginning. So we really need help getting in there, um, using, there's, well, the ideal is that whatever you bring, you will find a place for it. We don't want to grow the biggest list in the world. We don't want to rival the Avazas with their 30 million people email list. That's not what we're, that's not our contribution. What we want to do is to develop a more highly engaged, but much smaller community of meme warriors. People who are really fixated and really interested in, in this discourse level stuff, getting ideas out there, really, you know, being in the, being in the, the debates out there, on the message boards, on, the, on the, the comment boards on things, writing their blogs, writing for papers, and producing materials, whether it's videos or, or songs or whatever it is. We just need to kind of build up the chorus of the community of people who, who are prepared to kind of roll up their sleeves and get involved. So there you have it. Join the fight to shift paradigms at therules.org, and I highly, highly recommend watching their videos. All registered as Creative Commons, so you can spread that shit like dandelion seeds. My favorite, Capitalism is Just a Story, features spoken word artist Stacey Ann Chin outlining the hard truths we must accept if we are to manifest the most important truth, that we can change things. And fuck, if you don't feel jacked up to change the world after that, you may not have a central nervous system. Now, moving on, if capitalism is indeed just a story, then oligarchy and plutocracy are stories too. Nightmarish stories scribbled into our realities by the assholes on high, hiding behind a military industrial complex and each with an Achilles heel marked we the people. But before we sit down to write the people's odyssey, let's dig a bit deeper into those concepts in this week's Google That Shit segment. What the fuck is oligarchy? What the fuck is plutocracy? And why do people keep calling the US plutocratic or oligarchical? Well, let's take a look. Oligarchy, a small group of people having control of a country, organization, or institution. Plutocracy, government by the wealthy. So we can end the pissing contest, everyone. We're both. We are a plutogarchy or a oligocracy, or make your own. We are a country governed by a small group of people who are also either themselves members of the 1% or paid off by the 1%. Government by a small group of wealthy. Boom. Now, in practice, what does this mean? Well, I could show you a video that outlines it with the use of graphs and total lack of comedy, but what fun would that be? I'd rather share with you activist comedian Lee Camp's take on said video and how our system works of, for, and by the Plutogarchs. Unfortunately, the way America actually works doesn't even come close. Take an idea that nobody supports, literally nobody, and it has about a 30% chance of becoming federal law. Now, take an incredibly popular idea, the most popular idea this country has ever seen, and there's also about a 30% chance of it becoming law. Wait, so the paid absurdity leave and the squirrel milk pizza have the same chance of becoming a law? No, I must have misheard him. He's certainly not saying that the number of American voters for or against any idea has no impact on the likelihood that Congress will make a law. This means that the number of American voters for or against any idea has no impact on the likelihood that Congress will make it law. But what happened to the whole vote for the Democrat or the Republican and they'll fix everything with the thing and you pull the lever and you get, a, get a little sticker that says I voted? Go me. But there's a catch. I knew it. There's a catch, all right? The catch is, if you try really hard, then all your dreams will come true. <laughs> this flat line only accounts for the bottom 90% of income earners in America. Economic elites, business interests, people who can afford lobbyists, they get their own line. Look at how much closer their line is to the ideal. That's a 
crappy catch? You can't, you can't tell me a crappy thing and then go, but there's a catch, and tell me something worse. You, you can't be like, we regret to inform you that you lost everything you have on the stock market today, but there's a catch. You're infected with Ebola. But, silver lining, your mother also has it. But, look on the bright side, your dog is missing. But, glass is half full, your missing dog is dead. You can't do that! Point is, this Princeton study is not good. But don't give up hope. The answer is not learned helplessness, and it's not to avoid voting. The answer is to fight for ideas outside of the two-party rig system, outside of the corporatocracy. For more comedy and activism, be sure to check out Redacted Tonight every Friday at 8 p.m. on RT. Wrapping up, I'd like to give a big shout out to France for using common sense twice. That's like double the amount that we've used in the past 40 years. First off, it is now mandatory that all commercial buildings in France be at least partially covered in either solar panels, plants, or both. This comes after years of pushing from environmental activists whose goal it was to cover all new buildings with solar panels and plants. Ultimately, they reached a compromise with the conservative members of the government so as to only require this of commercial buildings. Once again, conservatives shit on progress. Regardless, this is a big win for the environmental movement in France, and further proof that the power of the people gets shit done. And in line with our previous stories from this week, France is also making it illegal for supermarkets to throw away food, mandating that they either donate products or send them to be used as animal feed, compost, or energy. Smart shit, right? I mean, consider all the food you see just walking through a supermarket. Now consider how much of that doesn't get sold. As the expiration date creeps up, it gets tossed, oftentimes covered in bleach even, to keep animals and insects away or to cover up the smell of perfectly good food rotting. No pun intended, but to all my ag and environmental activists out there, let's plant this seed and grow some rebellion. Vive la France. To finish out this week, I want to leave you with this quote by Albert Camus, who in his book, The Rebel, writes, Rebellion is born of the spectacle of irrationality, confronted with an unjust and incomprehensible condition. That's all it takes to start a rebellion. Pay attention. Confront these conditions. Homelessness, poverty, slavery, environmental destruction, racism, imperialism. Confront them. Do not shy away by placing a coin in a jar and marking the world saved. Rebel. Rebel, and don't let them win the war for your imagination. Think, react, do something. Hit share on this video. Go to the sites at the end of this episode and dive in. The unjust and incomprehensible are ready to be toppled. Let's get to work. On that note, thank you for watching, and as per usual, check out the last slide to see all the sites that you'll be going to. There will also be a link to help support Occupy.com and the delicious descent delivered daily thanks to donations like yours. It is a 501c3, so anything you can contribute is tax deductible and hugely appreciated. Be sure to follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and subscribe on YouTube. From this beautifully decorated, berry-dropping devil's den, good night and act out.